I'm talking a little bit about the early stages of what will, at this point, be a two-year research project looking at ways in which we can reconceptualize and rethink how we train teachers. And teachers featured quite a lot in the survey that Derek and Viv and Tammy talked about. Um, students wanting better tutors, students wanting more integration between tutoring and lecturing. And not surprisingly, tutors want that too. They want more communication with lecturers. They want more time with lecturers as well, the lecturers that they're working with. So what I started last year in the faculty of EMS was working with Megan Band, who's their tutor coordinator, running some large-scale workshops for tutors to augment the other kinds of training. But these were a little bit ad hoc because we really only started thinking about it last year. And I started thinking out of this about how we could make tutor training more tutor-centered, more learning-centered, but learning about tutoring, learning about teaching, learning about their role in teaching and learning, which a lot of tutors are not very aware of. I don't think they've even really given one. Um, so we did a, a large tutoring audit last year. I don't like calling it an audit. I don't like that word. We did a survey of academic departments using Google Forms, and 40 academic departments um, responded. It's incomplete. Um, a couple of faculties really didn't give us very much data at all, and other faculties gave us lots of data. But it is representative because all seven faculties did actually contribute in small or large ways. There were almost a 1,000 student tutors in this incomplete survey, 976 to be exact, which is a lot, probably more than you thought there were. <laughs> and the numbers are probably quite similar in 2013 if you look at how the budgets have not really grown terribly much. They've kind of stayed the same and people either seem to be working within those or slightly expanding their operations. So I think we can probably assume that there are around about 1,000 tutors on campus again this year, if not slightly more. But the data interestingly pointed to different understandings of what people meant when they said training. So some departments provided initial more generic training and then followed up with regular meetings, not necessarily weekly, sometimes every two or three weeks, sometimes once or twice a term, sometimes a few times a semester. And they talked about discussing course content, discussing ways of facilitating the learning of that, discussing assessment and feedback and then raising problem solving and evaluation issues. So tutors had an opportunity to say, I had this problem in this type, this is what the student wasn't understanding or whatever the case was. So there's that approach. And then there were other tutors who had little or no initial training, were kind of selected and given the material and off you go and tutor. Um, they, or they had quite ad hoc training. There were weekly meetings, but from what the lecturers were, or the tutor coordinators, whoever it was, provided me with that data, they didn't really seem to be very well defined or well organized. They seemed to be rather ad hoc. Oh, we've got a test coming up next week. We need to have a meeting about the test. Rather than a carefully planned out um, strategy for training and also I want to say support. So I think the training needs to be understood differently and more holistically. I'm much more interested in a kind of sense of capacity building on a larger scale rather than simply doing these little bits and pieces of equipping tutors with what might end up being decontextualized skills or little pieces of information that don't necessarily obviously cohere into an overall picture of what it is that they're doing or the role they play in that course. So um, I think we need to identify core skills and abilities and knowledge that are necessary for successful peer tutors and then work over time to develop these in the peer tutors that are selected. Um, obviously, this will be different for different faculties for different departments. Not all of your tutors are going to be doing the same things. So also a kind of one size fits all approach to tutor training at UWC really isn't going to work either because some people will love it and buy into it and some people will feel completely alienated and frustrated by it. So we are in the process of starting to develop some kind of framework and that will be happening next semester. This is tiny but in terms of the, I just wanted to draw your attention to these two categories. When I asked people, what are your tutors responsible for? Um, a large percentage said facilitating small group tutorials and consulting with students individually about their coursework. It was 91 and 70%. So that's very active, hands-on, face-to-face engagement with students. is a huge part of what tutors are doing. I'm not going to dwell on the rest of it. But the survey indicates that in spite of the fact that tutors are being asked to be quite active, the training is not, on the whole, active at all. There's a lot of 
implication of quite passive training. Well, they come to a meeting and we take them through a memo and tell them what they have to mark in the memo. Or one of the frequent comments was, we have weekly meetings where the lecturer will discuss with the tutors what they have to teach that week. But there's no real sense there that the tutors are being actively engaged in this process. So I started thinking, well, if you want your training, if you want your tutors to be interactive and engaging, then you have to engage them when you train them. If you want them to participate and encourage students to participate, then you have to enable and equip them to do that. Facilitation is not something that just comes naturally. You have to learn how to be a good facilitator. You can't just walk into a classroom as a third year student and run a fabulous interactive participatory tutorial without getting some kind of training in that. So I think we, we need to be very careful, I'll take Denise's point, challenge our assumptions. What are we assuming these students know or can do or who they are? Not all of the tutors on this campus are postgrads. Many of them are senior undergraduate students. Probably too many, perhaps. But we also at GWC don't necessarily have the postgraduate numbers in certain departments that we need. And so we are almost forced in some situations to select our senior undergraduates and tutors in order to have that assistance in large classes. And there are all sorts of issues around that. But there's a, a wide range of experience and there's a wide range of uh, exposure to the discipline and there's a lot of different kinds of levels of knowledge that tutors have going into tutoring. They're not all PhD and MA students and not some of them don't have any experience of working with others in this way. So again, it's an ongoing process of finding out exactly who these tutors are and what they can and can't do. But it is not clear that the current trend, the overall trend in training, is meeting the demands made of the tutors. And if you think quite carefully about it, what it is that you want your tutors to do, sometimes we're asking an enormous amount of people who may not necessarily have enough when they go into tutoring to meet those demands. And so I think there's a big ask also of training of these tutors and supporting them. So if you want active tutors, you have to have active training. Uh, it's quite, I think, quite simple, but also quite complex and quite difficult to do. So I think we need to have, um, in, a, in equipping and enabling training, because a lot of what lecturers talked about was the tutorials needed to be these small group interactions. That was the point. They're more intimate spaces where students can get to know the knowledge more intimately. They can really grapple with issues and problems. Well, that means your tutors need to be quite knowledgeable in the subject matter. Because if they're not, then how are they going to be facilitating that deeper access to knowledge? They want students to do more group work. Then you need to have a tutor who can run group work effectively and who can manage that kind of environment so that certain students don't spend all the time talking and some students don't spend any time talking, for example, and so on. So I think we need to create more inclusive training as a starting point to creating more inclusive tutorial practices. Underhill and McDonald argue that if you want the university to be an inclusive place of lots of people's different styles of learning and ways of going about doing things, then you need to start with the teaching and learning. You need to start at that higher level. You can't sort of start from the bottom and move to the top only. You have, have to go the other way around. So I think we need engaging training and support that locates students within this wider discourse. Do they know what you're teaching? priorities are in your department? Do they know what your teaching and learning strategy is for the faculty? Have you shared those documents with them? Do they know about the graduate attributes and how you're embedding them in your curricula? Because if your tutors don't understand it, then how are they contributing to helping you make that clear to your students? They are a fabulous resource, but I think a lot of tutors are being underutilized as, as a resource and as a support system for lecturers in teaching and learning because they don't understand what the department's priorities are in teaching because they don't understand this discourse, because they're not being given access to it. And this was a moment of realization I had in my own writing center in 2010, where I'd been working probably for about a year and doing an enormous amount of learning on my feet. And suddenly halfway through the year thought, this isn't working, because they're not speaking this discourse of academic literacy and things that I'm starting to read myself into. I'm not sharing any of this with them, but I'm expecting them to operate in these kinds of ways with students in the writing tutorials. So we started a theoretical reading group. And now my tutors have quite a vast repertoire of theories for language around writing centre practice and theory and academic literacies. And it's enhanced their practice enormously. And now we can actually have conversations. And they know exactly how they fit into the smaller and wider structures in which we work. 
And I think that was missing initially, and it was a stumbling block. So I've kind of done a little bit of this myself with my own tutors. So I'm not really going to talk too much about the human capabilities approach because time is limited. And really what I've been focusing on more is this. The human capabilities approach is quite new in my thinking about this. But I started off, I went to a couple of participatory learning and action workshops and had so much fun that I thought, this is a really fun way of actually doing this kind of thing. Let me see if I can try it with some of the tutors I have access to. So Arana and I have worked together with CHS tutors. I've obviously guinea picked my own tutors in the writing centre. They have to be guinea pigs for everything I try out. Um, this is part of the job description. Shame, they've actually had to be guinea pigs for quite a lot of different things over the last few years. But they're very game. Um, and then I did one <coughs> workshop with a group of tutors from Women's and Gender Studies. So it's a small group that we've been working with this year, but there's been some um, encouraging feedback so far. So participatory learning in action is defined as a family of approaches or methods or attitudes or behaviors that critically for my purposes and training enable people to analyze their knowledge of life conditions and plan, act, monitor, evaluate, reflect. That's what I wanted tutors to start doing, to bring themselves into that space and think, how was it for me as a student? The, one of the first exercises we did was good tutor, bad tutor. So we said, who was your best tutor and why? And who was your worst tutor and why? And they thought about it for a few minutes. They did like a think pair share kind of activity where they thought about it, then they shared with a partner, and then they shared with the whole group. And it was fascinating what came out of that. And in the feedback, a lot of them said that was one of the most interesting things for them because they found that other teachers around the table had had similar experiences. But it also enabled them to think about what it was about their best tutors that made them such good tutors. And a lot of it was things like they were available, they communicated, they knew the subject matter really clearly, they could help me with my questions, they were friendly, they were open, they were kind. A lot of the worst teacher practices were they were unavailable, they didn't know how to communicate properly, they just stood there and spoke to us for 45 minutes and we were bored. Um, they played on their cell phones while we were helping each other with problems. A lot of those kinds of things came out. So, what we did out of that was we then did a matrix exercise where we said, okay, so what are the principles that you can buy? If you're going to say a successful tutor is and a successful tutorial is, rank them. And then they had to come up with a list, whittle it down to eight kind of principles or statements, and then they all voted on what they thought was the most important and we ranked them. And that was a really interesting exercise um, for them and for me. So we've also done a river of life. We started off the training this year by getting everybody to draw a river of life and share around the table. And it was completely fascinating. I tried it on my own tutors, and they were a bit skeptical, I think, because we'd never done anything like that before. But they really, really enjoyed it, and that was one of the best sessions. And a couple of them said, well, I can't really see how I could use this with my tutors, but with my students. But then I said, well, it's not necessarily, I'm not teaching you tools you're going to immediately take into your tutorials with you and use there. Some of these you will, some of these you won't. But it was a nice exercise also for introducing them to one another and for getting them to know one another in a deeper way because tutors also have to be their own support systems so that if you can't get hold of the lecturer well you can go and talk to another tutor and say I'm having this problem in my tech can you help me my tutors do that a lot with each other and that's one of the biggest highlights for them working in the writing centre is that they have this resource they know they have these peers and these colleagues who are there for them so I think if you can build that in your own spaces with your own tutors that's incredibly valuable for them so we did this pilot, slightly different iterations, because my teachers in the writing centre need a whole component on academic literacies and, literacies and writing that might not necessarily look the same in the faculties, where different departments do different writing practices and we have to be a little bit more generic. Um, so, and obviously also it's a different access. I can only get hold of the CHS tutors maybe three, four times a year if we're lucky and we can get them all together. We tried to get them together in May and it was a little bit of a disaster, only 12 people came. Whereas we saw probably 45 students at the beginning of the year. So it was only a quarter of the group. Whereas I have my writing centre tutors every Monday from 1 until 2 p.m. They're a captive audience, they have to be there, it's ongoing training throughout the year. So I could do different kinds of things with them that I did with the, than I did with the initial tutors. So, the other two, I mean, women's and gender studies, I think it was just really like a long morning. But it was only five of them, so we also managed to do quite a lot more in a morning than I could do with 15 students or 20 students. So we had one and a half days with the first large group of CHS students, and that was actually quite nice. It was three sessions. 
So they were very interactive. I did a very little talking, which any of you can know me, it's quite uncharacteristic for me, it was quite nice, <laughs> did very little talking. Um, and it was really focused on their contributions, on not only their experiences of tutors, because some of them had tutored before and some of them were novice tutors. So for the novice tutors was kind of saying, what do I think my role is going to be? What do I think this, is, this job is asking of me? And then the returning tutors saying, well, how has it been for me so far being a tutor and how would I like to change my practices or improve them? And then obviously bringing their role as students in. Well, you were a student too once. You still are a student. But now you're coming at it from the other side as a tutor of students. So if this is your worst kind of tutor, then you know what you don't want to be. So now let's help you work out what you do want to be and help you ena enable you to do that. So I did do some inputs, which was really more about just consolidating and summarizing a lot of their inputs around the table, because it was very discussion-based, clarifying some of their responses. There was a little bit of formal, slightly theory-based discussion, trying to kind of talk them into a little bit of a constructive alignment strategy, a little bit of kind of student-centered learning approach that a lot of um, our approaches to teaching and learning are taking, so that they are a little bit aware of those discourses. But there was very limited time, so we didn't want to do a lot of that. <coughs> And then we have been attempting to do both initial and then follow up ongoing training, but logistics are always a struggle. So these are some of our examples. That's one of the um, kind of matrix type exercises which I wrote up in pretty colors and is stuck in our boardroom in the writing center. That's a successful writing tutorial, one to eight. Um, this is one of the rivers of life that one of the tutors drew and explained. This is one of the more symbolic ones. A lot of them had lots of writing on. And then in the CHS training we did objective and problem trees in this May iteration. So we said, well, you've been tutors for a semester. Draw your problem tree. So what are the things that have really, really stumped you or you've been struggling with or that have been difficult? And then at the bottom where the roots should go, I'll show you one here. So this is the bottom. So we said, well, what sustains you then? If these are all the things that you find difficult, you keep doing this. This is still something you're interested in doing. So what are your roots? What are the positives? What are the things that have been great about you during this semester? And the coordinate, some of the coordinators were there and they filled this in as well. And then that's my river of life, so I'll just put my own personal one in there. So it's quite pretty, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. Um, I don't get to do a lot of drawing. I do a lot of writing. So it's quite nice when people let me loose with cookies and crayons, I get a bit carried away. So the initial feedback, and this is just a snapshot because I took a lot of, I got a lot of feedback. They did feedback on every single session. They did kind of freehand feedback, and then I also kind of got them to do a positive, negative, interesting type exercise. So they got to tell me what they liked and what they didn't like, and then what was interesting and what they weren't expecting but had intrigued them. So you can see that, I'm not going to read them all to you, but they learned how creative it was. Um, and they talk a lot about how it was group involvement. It helped getting other opinions, learning from each other. I love that one. Interactive and open equals more learning. Um, it was different, didn't know what to expect, but we were all included and it was so much fun. I like how we reflect on our past experiences and related to tutoring, help us realize we are the instruments for student support, which is quite a powerful one. And then one of the other people said, um, I don't know if I put it on here, but what was, what was quite interesting was that the, the, a few of them spoke about that point three. So remember that the students have different backgrounds. We all around the table have different backgrounds, but so do the students. And that, I think, was one of the things that came out of the River of Life. I said, could you imagine what would happen if you did this with your students? How many different stories would you have around your tutorial venue? And I just kind of left that with them. And I think that was quite an interesting thinking point for them. Because I think they also make assumptions about who their students are. We all do. So where to from here? This is my conclusion. I don't, I'm still thinking about a lot of this. Like I said, this is six months into a two-year two research process. Might, might be longer. But I think we need to do greater learning about current good training practices because there were a lot of good training practices that the survey surfaced where people really are trying to engage their tutors in initial and ongoing training that does have that more holistic capacity and support development kind of framework in mind. And we need to incorporate the people who do this training and their methods into some of the things that we're doing from the direction of teaching and learning. We need to be reaching a greater number of tutors who would be benefiting from this training so far it's really just me working with teaching and learning specialists who are willing, so there's a very small scope at the moment where we need to try and expand that, and that's in the works. Crucially, we have to involve lecturers. You can't, you can't as a lecturer, farm your teacher training out to somebody else and say, please can you train my teachers for three days, 
And then it's the same kind of thing as academic literacy support. You can't farm your students out to the writing centre and expect that we're going to fix them and then send them back to you as writers. It's an ongoing process, there's ongoing learning. And as problems crop up and as tutors grow and learn and develop, they're going to need different kinds of training and support. So lecturers is, need to be much more involved in the initial and the ongoing training, also particularly where disciplinary knowledge and discourses are concerned. Because a tutor trainer like me can't necessarily come in and speak to you about any of that. And even if you have masters and PhD tutors, they're not experts in the discipline in the way that you, if you've lecturing for 20 years, might be. And there's a lot of stuff you do tacitly and intuitively because you've learned it over the years. So that's the kind of thing that lecturers really need to be very involved in, if indeed it is the fact that their tutors are expected to have quite a big role in helping students understand disciplinary knowledge and content. And then we need to keep going with our ongoing developments and refining of our workshops, um, learning from our mistakes, learning from our, the stuff that's gone well, and keep researching and keep reflecting on, on our practice. So that's pretty much what I had to say. And I think I've made it 20 minutes. Oh, I did. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> no, you were two minutes over the time, but it was oh. <laughs> according to my watch, I was. It also <laughs> seems like we might not have the next session, so we can oh, okay. take a little bit more time for questions and discussion. But what we're thinking to do is to have an earlier lunch so we can conclude a bit earlier this afternoon, um, because it does end quite late. Thanks very much, June, and I'm meant to say that. <clears throat> Sharon does do one day a week at the Teaching and Learning, two days a week at the Teaching and Learning Directorate, and um, that we have all benefited hugely from her tutor training. Um, questions and comments? Yes, if I can answer that first, the tutors, when asked, recorded quite a range of different responses. Um, some of them are motivated by the fact that they're foreign postgraduate students, they don't get bursaries and so they need a living income while they're studying. Um, all but one of my tutors are foreign students and that is a big motivation for them. But the bigger motivation for a lot of tutors is wanting to help other students and wanting to learn from that experience because they feel like this is something that's going to help them one day in the workplace, these skills and these abilities that they're learning. And I think they get a lot out of it. And um, when we spoke to the CHS tutors in May, they said, yeah, there are lots of things that are frustrating, but it's so exciting working with other students and seeing them like catch on to something and, and then they get a, a concept that they didn't get before and you think, I had something to do with that. I'm helping to make learning more interesting. So they have that as motivation. So I don't think the money is a big motivator um, because the money is variable depending on the budgets that departments get. But there's confusion officially over how many hours teachers are allowed to work because uh, the directorate the kind of communication from the DUC academic when the tutor rates were changed at the beginning of last year was 10 hours per week, which is an NRF guideline, I believe, for NRF bursary holders. They're not allowed to hold more than 10 hours a week other employment. Um, but according to Amanda Glazer, who's the head of HR who checked with Professor Chiwula, it's 20 hours a week, which is more, I think, a work permit, study permit department of home affairs type guideline. So there is some space there for clarification. What a lot of tutors tend to do is they hold one 10 hour a week contract and another 10 hour a week contract and out of those two they make their 20. But they shouldn't be working more than 20 hours. Unfortunately a lot of the feedback we're getting from tutors that we are working with is that some of them are quite drastically overworked. They're only paid for 10 hours but actually physically it ends up being more like 15 and 20 especially when they're doing marking and assessment which a lot of them shouldn't be doing. So we do, we do have some logistical issues that we have to clarify and investigate and look into further. Because obviously that does affect tutors carrying on. I mean, we don't want to have to train and train and train brand new tutors every single year. We want to try and retain. If you're going to have a PhD student here for three years, I'd like to have that student tutoring with me for three years and then bring that tutor into the training process and have their voice and their experience be part of what trains new tutors coming in so that you actually build capacity in lots of different ways. But I think there's also a lot of attrition. We lose a lot of tutors to better paid employment and also to, to other kinds of things. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Any other questions?
creating uh, a disciplinary, like an environment of mutual accountability. So I don't run all the teacher training sessions. My teachers train each other. So I've given them sessions where they have to run staff seminars and they pair up and they choose a topic that they think is really interesting and other people need to learn about. And then they prepare something and they put it together. So it's, we have co-ownership of that space, um, which has been incredibly powerful. And three years ago I had Lots of, oh, I can't come to the meeting on Monday because I have to go and have a meeting with my supervisor or I have this other thing that I have to do, please excuse me from the Monday meeting, even though the Monday meetings have always been compulsory because they are they get paid to come to those meetings and to part, be part of the training. That's another thing as well, is maybe making it part of the whole program so that it's worked into the hours tutors get paid for. Um, so if you're claiming, you can always use that as a, well, you can't claim that hour because you didn't come to that meeting and then that might be another way of getting them to come. But I don't like those kind of characteristics. Um, I prefer to make it, they know if they don't come to a meeting, they're going to miss something that's really quite valuable to them. They're going to miss being a part of their team and they're going to miss hearing something interesting or learning something new or learning something interesting. And when you make it a shared space where we all have ownership of it, then they also start to kind of monitor each other. So I don't have to say, where were you on Monday? One of my tutors will say, why weren't you at the Monday meeting? Where were you? Oh, I had a meeting with my supervisor. Or couldn't you have made the meeting another time? It's only 10 hours a week. Can't you meet with your supervisor outside of those 10 hours? That kind of thing. And I think for, for us in the writing center, that's been hugely successful, making it a co-owned space. So that it's not just me saying, you must be at the meeting, but it's everybody saying, let's get together and have a conversation about what's going on and learn from one another. And, and it makes it more fun as well. And we have biscuits. <laughs> I, in the feedback every year, I say, what was positive? And at least five of them will say, having biscuits on Monday meetings really helps. <laughs> So you could always just buy a few boxes of baby's biscuits and say, come have coffee and biscuits and we'll chat about what's going on and you can have some, I mean, the small little things, but they make a difference. Yes. One, I think there was one more. Yeah? Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm thinking about our Um, 
sometimes I think it's the availability, who's available. If you don't have postgraduate students or you don't have many postgraduate students, I think then you kind of look to the next level down and the next level down. I, I agree with you that there sometimes are two junior students doing it. And I think you can use junior students, but you can use them in a different kind of way, the different roles that they can play. Um, some departments have very strict criteria. I know EMS, Megan, has been working very hard at developing a selection criteria you know, interview process so that the teachers are quite carefully selected for, for the job that they have to do and so you get the best possible people. But I think it does also depend. I have very strict criteria, but I'm, I can't. The relation between content and process when you need to talk to what extent do you think the teachers are involved in having any interesting process? Very little. Overall, very little. That that's happening, that's a space? Yeah. No, we identified that in the teacher survey is quite a big gap. That they're asked to do a lot of that. Give formative and summative feedback, but very little training of giving formative and summative feedback, for example, actually happens. But again, you have to have quite a lot of contact time with those teachers to be able to do that training on an ongoing basis, and I'm not going to get that contact time. So then it means working in a different way with the lecturers and departments. So, yeah, ongoing process. <laughs> uh, we're going to take one more question which was over there. Oh, Kai, right. I know you had your hand up again, but we can do it over I'll lunch take, yes. and we'll take one last question. Mine was a comment, so if she or wants to ask a question. No, there's enough time for a comment. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm from the science faculty, chemistry department, and we use demonstrators and tutors. And we, I've, I've actually been this with an ongoing research project around the Demonstrator learning, and I'll say something about that later this afternoon. But so, so what we, what I found is that it, it's actually beneficial to use younger students as demonstrators because their experience is very close to the experience mm -hmm. of the students. And for us, how that helps is demonstrating has a lot to do with, with uh, facilitating processes in the laboratory. So our demonstrators. They, when, they be, when they mature, when they become postgraduate students, mm -hmm. they are often ready to, to be apprentice tutors. So they, they, yes. so they ease into the process and by the time they are... They did come through in the two of the departments from Natural Sciences who responded to the survey yeah. made that yeah. distinction yeah. that they start yeah. off being demonstrators and graduate to being tutors in a way through yeah. that experience. Yeah. No, I mean, these are all things that we want to follow up on which will be part of our next phase of Thinking, but thank you. I'm earmarking to come and talk to you now. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Thanks okay. very much, Sharon. Thank, thank you, everybody. So